Hi everyone, and uh, welcome back. Welcome to Allied Health 102, Introduction to Phlebotomy. My name is Melissa Shepard, and I'll be your instructor for this course. As a lot of you may be aware, uh, due to COVID-19, uh, this is one of those courses that originally was not uh, taught online at all in any fashion, um, but we have uh, adapted well and we've moved it online. So the good thing is you will be on campus uh, at your designated time for your lab and we will be able to meet face to face. So uh, that will help us out on some of the, the transitioning. So, and we're going to start off by going over the things that you're doing and going over your um, syllabus and your tentative course calendar. So you will easily know what is expected of you to make this easy. I'm gonna give you all the tools you need to be successful in this program and make a great grade. So the first thing we wanna talk about is your first assignment. Now, if you were taking this um, in class, I'd be talking to you about how to work Canvas, but you all should be, if you're watching this video, you figured that out by now, I hope. So also another thing, when we were meeting um, on campus and this was not an online class, you had the availability of the student to be able to go to the learning uh, center and the library, Learning Commons, and be able to print out things that you need. So the way we had it set up then uh, for our uh, for our in face-to-face -face students was they would be able to just print out all the paperwork they needed and have it ready uh, that first day of class. What I'm going to ask of you guys is I'm gonna show you where those chapters are. They're there, but the only chapter I want you to worry about printing uh, the review guides for, the study guides, is for chapter one. So if you can, if you have access to a printer, please go ahead and just print out the study guides and review guides for chapter one only. I'm going to have all the rest of the stuff printed out for you, and I will give it to you on your first day of lab. But I would like you, if you can, to go ahead and print chapter one so you could get started now, okay? If not, you know, we'll work with that and um, you can pick, you will have chapter one when you, when you pick it up, but you would then definitely need to go ahead and read chapter one um, and uh, get started with, with reading chapter one. So you'll be ready and watching these PowerPoints. That way, when you do get your study guide, you can quickly go back and be able to answer those questions that's on that study guide because those are the things you're going to need to study for your test. Okay, so um, you're going to purchase a one inch black binder, okay, uh, to place the stuff that I am, that chapter one that you print out and all the other 17 chapters and assignments that are listed on Canvas, I will have them printed out and give to you and then you can put them in your black one inch binder. Now I'm gonna offer points. Uh, you're gonna get a grade for turning this black binder in at some point uh, around the time of your first test, probably at your lab class. So the day you have the test, uh, you will also be coming onto campus for your lab uh, assignment, either that Tuesday or that Thursday, and then you will turn it into me and I'll grade it. Now, what am I looking for when I grade your black binder? I'm looking that you have all of those 17 chapters placed into that binder and all of our assignments and study guides and reviews. I'm looking to see that you bought um, separators with tabs on it and have chapter one, chapter two, all tabbed out, okay, in the correct order. That is what I'm looking for for your grade. Um, also, there'll be questions with asterisks by them. You don't need to answer those, okay? They'll already be answered for you. So uh, the next thing that we're doing for points is you will have a discussion and uh, a discussion will be up. It will be for you to do on Canvas for you to write a personal essay about one to two paragraphs long about yourself, okay? That you'll get a bonus point for that and that'll be on Canvas and then and you'll be able to interact with your, uh, with me and with your fellow students. Also, we can't find my office uh, right now, but what you can do to get your bonus points is you can submit to me a listing of all the ways that you can reach me. And we're gonna go over that on the syllabus, but you can get a bonus point if you will just jot it down 
how you are to communicate with me, what's my office hours, how can you communicate during those times, how can you communicate with me outside of those times, and how do you get in touch with me. You can also get bonus points for putting a face shot, face shots only, up close face shot of yourself on Canvas, okay? Now that's for lecture. Those are all the things we're gonna do for lecture. So just read over this carefully. And again, like I said, really printing out the reviews for chapter one is all you need because you're gonna get started on that. And we will cover, each week we will cover a chapter. So week one, because when we're in class doing this, we, we cover about half a chapter per classroom time. And you typically in classroom, if you're doing face-to-face, -face, twice a week. So you cover about a chapter a week. So our first test will be on chapters one, six, and seven, okay? So at the end of these, at the end of this time when we take our first test, you'll be taking your test on chapters one, six, and seven. So now, you can read through that if you have any, at the end, you guys can already re, always reach out to me with any questions you have about this, okay? But I'm not gonna sit here and read this stuff to you verbatim, okay? You can see it up here on the screen and you should print out a copy of your syllabus, which is on Canvas for this course. And I will have uh, paper copies of the syllabus for you when we meet for lab, okay? So as far as lab assignments, so now you're gonna have that black binder that you bought yourself that you'll put those assignments and review guides in for lecture. For lab, when you come to lab class, I'm gonna hand out a white three-ring bi three ring binder to you that will have all your worksheets in it, okay? So when it talks about completing worksheet 1A on professionalism, you won't be able to do anything with this until you get your white binder the first day of your lab class. And then we're gonna go over that binder top to bottom. All the chapters that you need to read, there will, will be in there. At the end of each chapter will be review guides, study guides for you to go back over for that chapter. And then of course there will be worksheets, the things that you will do in class with me, and then there's things that you will do at home. But you're, you'll get that in class your first day of lab. And here is a shot of where it says start here and then you can go in here and there's the syllabus you can print. There's the master syllabus and then there's the syllabus itself and you wanna just get your syllabus for 102 printed out, okay? And like I said, I'll have some copies on your first day of lab. And then here's each one of your chapter reviews, your study guides for your major test. And if you notice that one at the top says chapter one. That is the only one that I want you guys, if you can, if you have access to a printer somewhere, to go ahead and print just that one out and then start reading chapter one and filling in that review guide, okay? But as you can see, you have um, lecture quiz one study guide, and we'll go over that in a second, and then I'm gonna have uh, study guides for your lecture and lab finals, and I'll have copies of those for you the first day of lab. But if you can, print that one out. So now for lecture, what are you gonna need? You're gonna need your textbook, which there's a listing of exactly um, that textbook. It's called the Phlebotomy Handbook and it's the 10th edition. And that is a required textbook, okay? Now you can buy a used one if you can find it. The thing I need you guys to remember is, I know a lot of people like to get these books and then sell them and I get that and I understand, but I'm being honest with you when I say this is a book you're gonna wanna keep because not only will you be using it for intro to a phlebotomy, but when you, get in, when you get into clinicals, you will need it for Allied Health 211 and moving forward. It's a very good book to help you pass the ASCP certification exam as well. On top of your uh, required uh, phlebotomy handbook textbook, you will also be given by me on the first day of lab, your phlebotomy workbook for lab that will include lectures, reviews, and lab worksheets. And then you will purchase a black binder, a one inch black binder, that you will place all the stuff I give you the first day of lab in there and, uh, and set it up the way I asked you to, okay? So just a little class business that we, I always like to keep up with everything. Just try, just make sure you keep in mind that your CPR must be up to date before you go to clinicals and it must not expire while you're in clinical. So just keep that in mind, make a note of that, make sure you understand it. If any of you have taken a lot of other, other college courses and you're interested in getting your Associates of Science degree, reach out to me, we can talk about that. I'd love to help you further your education. 
Also remember when you go to clinicals, you need to save some money for things like shots, physicals, and things like that. Could be around three to $400 depending, and we're gonna work with you guys to try to find the most cost-effective uh, solutions we can. Okay, so what must I do to get into phlebotomy clinicals? Okay, it's broken down like this. You have other classes that you have to take. Some of you may or may not have to take some math, uh, some math courses, some reading in English. We, we'll, we can always talk about that. Uh, there is a computer, um, a basic computer concept class that you have to take. And then there's a, 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 a psychology elective like intro to psych or something that has to be completed at some point in time. Now those classes, don't determine whether you go to clinicals or not. Now they need to be completed and you need to pass those classes at a C or better or either have placement testing or ACT scores that get you out of all the Englishes and maths. And then you still have to take that 100 level computer concept class and some type of psych elective like intro to psych or uh, developmental psychology. But again, they don't they don't matter as far as getting into clinicals. They just matter as far as you graduating, okay? But you do need to pass all those courses with a C or better. Now, when I sit down and make the decision, because I only have 15 slots for clinicals, who are the 15 people that are going to go to clinicals? I decide this by taking the grade point average from these qualifying courses that you see listed up here. Okay, your intro to phlebotomy and its lab, medical terminology, A and P and its lab, and healthcare systems and safety. So, if you really want to make sure that you get your spot into clinicals, okay, you want to make sure that you make the best possible grades you can on these qualifying courses, okay? Uh, most of our, uh, most of, mostly all of our clinical meetings are going to be virtual. There may be one clinical meeting that is not virtual. Um, these are almost always scheduled for Friday afternoon, so just make sure you keep that in mind. And the one that you have is listed on your tentative course calendar, included in with your syllabus. Uh, you'll have to have a flu shot, a TB test, and you will need your immunization records, but honestly what they're looking for now is that you have immunity. So they titer to make sure you have immunity because just because you got an immunization shots many, many years ago, you may no longer be immune to that particular immunization and they're gonna to want to give you a booster shot, okay? The clinical packet meeting is set for Friday, September the 25th and it will be a virtual meeting, okay? Again, my name is Melissa Shepard, okay? And um, the, this is my contact information and my office hours. So again, the best way to reach me at any time is by texting me on my cell phone because I check that several times a day, seven days a week, okay? If you email me, I check my email a couple of times during my, I check it several times during my office hours. I usually have it up and I refresh it often. So if you email me during my office hours, I will definitely be able to get back to your email immediately. If you call my office, uh, it will forward to my cell phone if I am not in my office. Um, and I do check my voicemail Monday through Friday during my office hours. And then I usually check it again uh, if I can, if I'm not in class earlier in the day and later in the day, okay? And then there's my email address. Um, and I usually, like I said, I do check it a little bit more than what it says, but if I'm busy teaching a class or if I'm busy doing something else, I may not have time outside my office hours to actually check it. So, but I do, I do check it. So if it's something that's not an emergency, you're welcome to send me information. And of course, right now we're having virtual office hours due to, um, due to our situation. So having said that, we can set up a time for you to meet with me during those office hours in any way, okay? There's multiple ways it can be done. And again, you can get bonus points for typing all this stuff up and sending it to me, okay? So ways that you can get in touch with me during my office hours, you can text me, you can call me, you can email me. You can ask for us to set up a virtual live conference screen. We can, we can set up a conference and we can log on and you and I can talk face-to-face -face seeing each other through the computer. 
We can set up a meeting any time like that. I can also, if need be, if, if your schedule just doesn't allow it, you and I can set up by appointment a meeting outside my office hours to talk about anything that you need to talk about. So remember, you can get bonus points for writing up something, explaining to me the multiple ways in which you can get in touch with me. Okay, so these are the course requirements to pass this course. All of this information is on your syllabus. So print that syllabus out and keep it. Use it often. Look at it. Not only does it have all the information you need about what's required of the course, how you get into clinicals, but you have a tentative course calendar that along with your weekly setups on Canvas, it will help you know what's coming, the dates that all this stuff is happening, so you will be prepared, okay? So you got to make a 70% or better on the finger stick and venipuncture skills test that you will have in lab. You have to make a 70% or better on at least five of the 10 case studies that you'll be doing and handing in, okay? And so there's 10 of them. At least five of them have to be passed at 70% or better. So these are serious. To pass this class, that has to be accomplished, okay? And we are going to discuss these case studies further when, I, when we talk about the first one that'll be due. You gotta make a minimum grade of 70% or better on all tests, including the final, and you need to complete all lab worksheets to pass this course. Attendance policy. Okay, so you wanna, you, first of all, you need to review that attendance policy online. You'll have some type of discussion question each week. It'll be very small with one response due, uh, and then during, during that week, and then there'll be a chance for the question will be asked, you'll respond to it. Then you'll have another deadline or another day in the week that you need to make some type of response to another one of your classmates, okay? And all this will be lined out for you. Also, any student who ceases to attend a class will be subject to a college initiated withdrawal, right? When a student has missed two weeks of class or four times, the student will be removed from the class and will receive a WN for the course. So you need to make sure that you get those uh, weekly discussion questions done and you need to make sure you're, you never ever miss your labs, okay? And as far as lecture makeups for tests and labs, they're not going to be excused without a doctor's excuse. Just, I can't do it right now because as far as lecture makeups on the, on, the, on the test, those tests will be due on a certain day and, and that's gonna be on your tentative course calendar the day that your tests are due, okay? And I want you guys to start looking at that tentative course calendar so you can see when that first test is going to be due. And um, what, I, what I want you to realize is that let's, whatever day it's due, okay? I'm gonna open up that test a few days before, okay? Now, what that means is if I open it up on a Wednesday, but the test on the syllabus, on the tentative course calendar shows that we're taking that test on a Friday, okay? We're taking that test on a Friday. It closes at midnight. I may open it up for people on a Monday. If you think you're ready to take that test, you've read all three of chapters one, six, and seven, you filled out all your review guides, you've been studying, you've read all your chapters, and you're ready. You've watched all the PowerPoint videos that I've put up for each and every chapter, and you're ready to go. You can go ahead and take that test like on Thursday, okay? But just remember, when you open the test, you have to complete it. You can't open it and then pause it and come back to it later. The minute you start that test, the clock starts ticking and you have to take it. They will be time test, okay? And it doesn't give you a lot of time to, to ponder. You're going to have time to sit there and think about the question, read the question, and answer the question. But the time has to be limited because I have to cut down on people's ability to look these questions up or cheat in some kind of way. So they will be timed, okay? So since you have this, you know way ahead of time when your test is going to be due, I'm going to open it up. Days before that, you will have access to everything you need early. There's going to be no excuses other than a sudden illness, and you will need a doctor's excuse to miss those lecture tests.
okay? And as far as lab is concerned, since we're trying to squeeze a lot of work into a very short period of time, and I need to get you properly trained before you go to clinicals, if you miss labs, you if you miss your lab, you missed two days, pretty much is what you did. Uh, and there's just no way for you to be able to make those labs up. So we'll have to handle this on a case by case basis, but I'm not even gonna even consider allowing you to make up those labs if you do not have a doctor's excuse. So do all you can not to miss these labs. They're too important and it's too difficult to make them up, okay? And again, if you have any questions on any of this, you can email me, you can text me, you can call me, or you can talk to me after your designated lab, lab time, okay? But go ahead and set your schedule up now to make sure you have whatever coverage you need, you have this time for labs set aside so that you can make every single lab classroom time. Okay, so I want you to look on your course calendar and I want you to figure out when is your first lab test, okay? When is your first lab test, okay? So if you look on there, okay, your first lecture quiz, number one, is scheduled for September the 10th. That's the one on profiles and panels. That's on page eight of your, of your syllabus or your tentative course calendar. And it'll show you that Canvas quiz number one and two uh, are due at midnight. Now, these, the tentative course calendar will also show you when those Canvas quiz opens so that you know they're open now. And then it also says, hey, it closes at midnight tonight. So you'll know, okay? So you, this tentative course calendar is your friend. Canvas will be your friend. There will be alerts letting you know that, that things are due and when they are due but you have to stay on top of it, okay? So what do we study, okay? So like I told you, if you can print out that study guide or review guide for chapter one from Canvas, okay? And, and study that, okay? There's also, for your lecture quiz one on profiles and panels, there is a blank one that I'm gonna give you. It's gonna be in that packet of stuff that I told you you don't have to print out that I'm gonna give to you your first day of lab that's a fill in the blank, okay? And so it, it shows you what all the blanks is. You're gonna have to study that and we'll go over that, okay? And then when is your first lab quiz, okay? Look on your tentative course calendar, find that date. What do you study for your lab quiz, okay? Remember our first, we're gonna have that lecture quiz that's gonna be on profiles and panels and we're gonna go over that. And your first lecture test will be on chapters one, six, and seven, okay? And you'll have review and study guides for each one of those chapters that you fill out and that's a lecture. In lab, the white lab binder I give you is going to have chapters one and then there'll be a study guide, review guide behind it. And then there'll be a chapter two in that white lab binder that you read and there'll be a study review guide behind it, okay? And you'll, fi you'll find each one of those review guides behind each chapter in the, at the beginning of that uh, white lab binder. And you have to study those for the test, okay? And then we'll be working on worksheets for chapters one and two. So when we get ready to take the test that day in lab, you will turn in all the worksheets that we have been working on in the lab to me for a grade at that time, okay? And then your lecture test. Find what day your lecture test is. What do we study for that? Chapters one, six, and seven, the study guide. You watch the PowerPoint presentations that I'm gonna have up. Each week, I'm gonna have that chapter up. I'm gonna have the PowerPoints for that chapter, okay? Okay, so this is what the profiles and panels study guide looks like. Name four tests in the electrolyte profile or the electrolyte panel or electrolytes, okay? Sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate. That's your answer, okay? Then name the 11 tests in the renal profile or panel, and then you name all 11 of those, okay? These, this is what you study. You study this, this is about putting this stuff to memory, okay? This is how doctors put tests together, okay? When he's looking for something, he, he groups tests together to be able to um, try to diagnose, monitor, and treat his patients, okay? 
So this is the rest of it. And down at the bottom, you have that question, what is another name for the compre comprehensive metabolic panel? The answer to that question is on page one that we just went over. So make sure you're studying that and looking for the answer to the question. Okay, and I'm gonna know, I'm telling you right now, if you get this right now, start studying it and get this down to memory, you will make an A on this test. Okay, and that's what it's gonna look like and you're gonna have to fill in the blanks based off that study guide that I gave you. Okay, so this is a, a video, a YouTube video that talks about um, what is a phlebotomist. So if you could, um, you know, um, go ahead and put this into your browser and uh, watch this video. It really gives you a good idea of uh, what a phlebotomist does. If you have any issues with this video link, please reach out to me and I can, uh, I can get it to you. So these are our objectives. And those, these are also listed in your textbook. And these are the things that when you get through with this chapter, these are the things that you're gonna know. From uh, a list of professional competencies for phlebotomists and key elements of performance assessment, all the way down to describing the roles of clinical laboratory personnel and common laboratory departments and sections. So make sure you read over these. I'm not gonna read every one of them to you but you're gonna know all this stuff. You're going to be able to list the basic tools used in quality improvement activities and get examples of how phlebotomists can participate in quality improvement activities. These are some higher learning and just some critical thinking slides. It's like studying for that profiles and panels. If you go over material over and over again, it's been proven to help you remember this material. And so you'll have these slides come up and I'm going to ask you a question, okay? And it's a way to help you learn new information. Try to answer the question and then it's okay to peek at your notes to help you. These are just ways for you to start really keying in on this information and memorizing it. Okay, let's start. We're talking about clinical decisions, okay? All right, so we all know when we go to the doctor, right? So you go into the doctor, they're going to get a medical history from you. And this is one of the things that the doctor is going to use to help um, do prevention with you, to prevent anything from happening to you, developing diabetes, developing cancer, things of these natures based off your, uh, your history. Okay, they're going to observe signs and symptoms. They're going to take your temperature. They're going to uh, take your blood pressure, right? Then they're going to do diagnostic testing, everything from lab tests to x-rays to MRIs. All these things are the, the tools that our doctors have to help prevent us from uh, being sick and from getting us better, right, and monitoring us, okay? So you have to understand that these laboratory test results play a vital role in the clinical decisions that physicians make. So we want to make sure that we're giving them the correct test results because they're basing their decisions for taking care of their patients, how to treat their patients, what medicines to give them, what medicines not to give them, based off these laboratory test results. So the job that a phlebotomist does is essential in making sure that he is making the right decisions. So we're going to talk about people who uh, perform phlebotomy tasks. Right. So people who draw blood, you have clinical laboratory personnel, uh, med techs, medical laboratory technicians, people like that. They draw blood, uh, including the certified phlebotomist, nurses, nurses, aides, respiratory therapists, all these people, medical assistants, all are people that perform phlebotomy tasks, drawing blood, things of that nature. Doctors rarely perform phlebotomy, right? They rarely perform phlebotomy. So here's one of our little questions. So you work at a doctor's office as a phlebotomist, okay? You're gonna call in sick that day, right? You tell the receptionist there's one person who works there that you probably don't want drawing blood because they rarely draw it. Who is that person? The doctor, right? Okay, so now we're going to break down uh, in medical terminology. That's why medical terminology is so valuable, guys. That's a great course. If you're taking that course right now, please make sure you give 210% to that because it will help you in the long run. 
because you can break these words up and they tell you what they mean. Okay? So, phlebo is the Greek word which is related to veins, and tomi is related to cutting, right? So, we're kind of making an incision into that vein to draw blood out, right? So, the phlebotomist or the blood collector is the individual who, who most often performs phlebotomy. So, they're going to be the best at it, right? Because the more you do something, the better, the more extensive you have extensive training directly related to phlebotomy. If you're a medical laboratory technician or a medical, te a medical technologist, you may have had a small part of your training dealing with phlebotomy, but because of all the other stuff you have to learn, it's just a small section of it. But phlebotomists, all their training goes directly towards that, so you are the expert at drawing blood. So they also, phlebotomists also assist in collection and the transportation of other specimens other than just blood, right? You might have arterial blood for ABGs. You may be transfer, trans, um, porting urine, some kind of tissue uh, specimens, uh, occult blood specimens, stool specimens, sputums, many other uh, different types of specimens down to the lab and you need to know what the best, uh, how those are trans transported, and you can perform clinical duties and clinical functions from answering the telephone to greeting your greeting your uh, patients to uh, filing to entering results into the computer to entering patient information into a computer. These are all things that may be part of a phlebotomist job. But the primary function for the phlebotomist is the accurate, safe, and reliable collection and transportation of blood and other specimens for analysis. That's your primary job, right? And I say it like that because you will hear as time goes on the word turnaround time. And in hospital, we need to get our job done quickly. We need to get into the patient's room or have our outpatient come in. We need to quickly draw the blood as quick as possible so that we can get it transported as quick as possible to the lab so the results, the tests can be run, so the results can get up to the doctor as fast as humanly possible so that he can make a clinical decision on his patient. Now, having said that, turnaround time is important, but we wanna make sure we do that accurately. In other words, we don't wanna get in such a hurry that we sacrifice these other things that are just as important as speed, right? Accurate. We want to make sure we do what we're doing accurately and safely. We don't want to get in so much a hurry that we miss a step, that we accidentally uh, stick someone with a needle, stick ourselves with a needle, that we cut corners. And we want to make sure that we're very reliable, not in just the collection of this blood, but that it is transported properly whether it needs to be transported, it needs to be shielded from light. It needs to be collected and transported on ice. It needs to be transported at, uh, at body temperature. It needs to get to the lab at a set time. These are all things that as a phlebotomist, we have to learn and make sure we do so that we report out the, the most accurate, reliable results we can to our physician as quickly as we can while we do it safely. So you go to work at Christian Schumper lab as a phlebotomist. What do you think your primary duty will be? Collecting blood. So now we're gonna talk about, um, so the laboratory analysis of specimens and the three purposes they're used for. You might have heard me say a little bit of this earlier. We talked about diagnose, diagnostic testing, okay? We're trying to figure out what's wrong. You come in, right? You're sick, you don't feel good, you're sick to your stomach, you got a headache, you're running a fever, whatever it may be. We're gonna draw some blood and we may run a CBC on you to see if you have some type of bacterial infection or does it look like you have a viral infection, okay? Those, that's the diagnostic, diagnostic testing point of it, okay? Figuring out what's wrong. Then, another way laboratory analysis of specimens is used is for a therapeutic assessment, okay? Deciding on appropriate drug or treatment, right? And then deciding, are you getting 
enough of this medicine to do its job, but not too much of the medicine, right? That it would, that it could harm you. And then there's monitoring. Okay, we wanna make sure the therapy is working and alleviating the disease. So in other words, if we're giving you a certain diet that you're, if you've been diagnosed as a diabetic and we're giving you a certain diet and exercise regimen you need to be on, and we are giving you medicine to help control your diabetes, we want to be able to check your glucose and your uh, hemoglobin A1C results often to make sure that the, the, we've got the right amount of medicine. Or if we put you on blood pressure medicine because you are hypertensive, we want to make sure by checking your uh, blood pressure that you have the right amount of medicine. These are different ways that doctors monitor the things that they're giving. And it's the same thing we use laboratory tests to monitor. So just to follow up, we use laboratory testing for to figure out what's wrong with you, to decide on the appropriate drug or treatment, and to monitor you to make sure that what we're doing for you is actually working. Okay? Now, technology has enabled us to move laboratory testing outside the lab, right? We have point of care testing in some cases, such as at the patient's bedside, you can do uh, glucose checks at the patient's bedside and at ancillary or mobile sites or even in the home. Okay, home, home health can come into your house. They can check your uh, blood glucose levels. They can set diabetics up with their own home testing um, device where they can check their glucose often throughout the day. There's other uh, testing that can be done uh, at the bedside and at mobile sites from cholesterol checks to hemoglobin checks. So now we're going to move on to healthcare settings and healthcare teams, okay? And you will be filling out your review guides as you're going through these things. So you'll you'll be watching these PowerPoints and then you'll have your review guides for chapter one right next to you. And as we're going through these, you will fill those review guides in and then you will study those review guides for your test, okay? So we have inpatient or hospital care. Okay, and then we have outpatient or ambulatory care. Okay, so inpatient, we know that's our patients that are up on the floor or in ICU and you go into their room and you draw their blood and then you transport their blood back down to the lab. They run their lab results and then they go back up if on the patient uh, record, whether it's a paper chart or an electronic medical record. And then you have outpatient or ambulatory care, right? This is where your patient may come in just to have some lab results done, may go to your, your uh, outpatient lab, or they're seeing their doctor that day and he sends them down to the outpatient lab to have lab work done. So still on the vein of uh, healthcare uh, settings and healthcare teams, these are some of the organizations and the departments that are inside hospitals. Now, you need to learn these because we're in the customer service business, guys. You gotta think of it like that. And if if the patient is walking down the hall and you walk past the patient and they ask you um, where the anesthesiology department is or where the cardiology department is or dermatology, where is that at? You're, or where is radiology? You're gonna need to know what these are, what it's about, so you can speak intelligently to your, to your patients and to your coworkers. And so you know where these departments are and what they do, okay? So again, you'll be filling out your reviews when you're doing this so you can study this and understand. So allergy, right? Those are, they, they treat reactions to uh, irritating agents. You know, like if you're allergic to uh, grass or if you're allergic to cats or dogs or certain food, okay? You might be sent to them to figure out what you're allergic to, okay? Then there's anesthesiology, right? Pain management before, during, and after surgery. Okay, a lot of people realize anesthesiology puts you to sleep when you're having surgery so you don't feel that pain, but they're also available for other types of pain management. Okay, they make sure that you're, you're not feeling a lot of pain before you have your surgery and after you have your surgery. Then we have cardiology and we know that treats heart and circulatory conditions. Then we have cardiovascular, right? That's surgical diagnosis and treatment of heart and blood circulation issues. Dermatology and dermatologists treat your skin conditions and diagnostic imaging or radiology, right? 
And so they, they sometimes you go in and you have x-rays done uh, for diagnosing this if you have a broken bone or other issues like that. Uh, they have some dyes uh, that will interfere with lab tests if they've been given that dye that day. So those are things that we have to take into consideration too when we're drawing blood, if they've had some type of dye injected in them due to some type of imaging or radiology test they had done. Then you got ECG and EKG, okay, uh, electrocardiograph, and it records electrical pulses and currents produced by your heart. Uh, you got your EEG, which records electrical currents produced by your brain. Endocrinology treats uh, disorders of the hormones. Family medicine, general practice, and that's just a doctor that cares for all your family members. And um, your gastroenterologist or gastroenterology which treats disorders of the, of the stomach, your intestine, your soft, always going up to your esophagus, okay? Then you got uh, geriatrics, that treats our elderly, right? Hematology, conditions of the blood. Immunology, treats conditions of your immune system. And internal medicine, treats conditions, one or more of those internal organs, okay? And then you have laboratory medicine and pathology, right? It's important because that's where you live, right? That's where phlebotomists bring the blood and the analysis of the blood and other body fluids and tissues for diagnosis, diagnosis, right? Treatment and monitoring of disease. And then you have neonatal and perinatal uh, that treats your premature and newborn babies and their mothers. And then you have nephrology, treats your kidneys, neurology, that's your nervous system. And then you have nuclear medicine. That's that radioactive isotopes or tracers, and they're used for diagnosis and treatment of patients. These two may interfere with laboratory tests. Okay, we talked about those dyes early, earlier in imaging and radiology. There are certain uh, radioactive isotopes given to patients in nuclear medicine that may actually interfere with lab tests as well. And those are things that we need to be aware of. Um, uh, dietetics and nutrition. Um, they do, they analyze patients, uh, nutritional information, they educate the patient, and they place patients that need it on special diets. And then, of course, we have pediatrics, which treats children. Psychiatry, neurology treats mental, emotional, and nervous system problems. You got OBGYNs, obstetrics and uh, gynecology, reproductive system for females, right? Occupational therapy for rehabilitative activities. Oncology for cancer, ophthalmology for your eyes and vision, uh, orthopedics about bones and joints, and um, orthonology treats your ears, nose, and throat, right? So we'll start off with still talking about healthcare teams and the systems and settings, right? You got pharmacy, right? Now, it's a, this is important because a lot of times the lab and phlebotomist will collaborate with pharmacy as far as time specimens for drug therapy for patients. You have peaks and troughs. And so we need to work well with the pharmacy and communicate well with them to be able to know when we need to draw our peaks and when, when we need to draw our troughs when these timed uh, situations are on because it depends on when they give them the medicine. Then we have physical medicine, um, treats uh, neuromuscular system, physical therapy, they, they do a lot of uh, physical exercise, restore physical abilities after some kind of injury or illness. And then plastic surgery, that's that cosmetic surgery or correction of some type of deformity like a cleft palate. Uh, proctology treats the anus and the rectum. And then pulmonary, right? That's respiratory therapist treating breathing disorders, right? That's treatment of the respiratory system. You got uh, rheumatology, also dealing with uh, joints and tissue disease. Uh, surgery, you want to surgery, it's going to alter some part of your body for treatment. Urology treats both reproductive and sexual uh, systems in men and renal systems in both men and women. And phlebotomists should become knowledgeable about these areas of the hospital because patients spend time in them prior to, during, and after your phlebotomy procedure. And you want to understand how the hospital works, where all these are located, who they are, what they do, so you can help your patient understand what's going on with your patients, and you can speak knowledgeably 
to both your patient and your coworkers. So make sure you take the time to fill out these review guides and start understanding what each of these uh, places mean, okay? So in which department would respiratory therapists work? Pulmonary, right? Which department would work with phlebotomists for patients receiving drug therapy? Pharmacy, right? That's what we talked about. And then which department would you go to to deliver the blood after you have drawn it? The lab, right? So while we're going through these critical thinking slides as we go on, and I have them in every chapter, what I'm trying to get you to do is reinforce the knowledge that you need to know, right? Reinforce the knowledge you need to know. So when these slides come up, you can pause this slide, pause this uh, PowerPoint presentation, and then you can see if you can answer it. See if you know it. See if you, your studying is working. See if the things that you're reading is hitting home. Because my tests come directly from the review guides. So moving on to the clinical laboratory and specimen collection services, okay? So a hospital-based clinical laboratory has two components. Your clinical uh, pathology, which is what we refer to as the lab, where they run the CBCs and they run the PTs and PTTs and other tests like that. And then you have the anatomic pathology part of the lab, and that's your pathology part that does um, histology, cystology, and things like that. So, uh, and, and, and make sure you're answering these questions on your review guide. Because again, like I said, that clinical pathology part, that's where we test all those, the blood and the body fluids like urine, we do our urinalysis in that part and stuff like that. And we examine some tissues in there, but the anatomic pathology is where we do the histology, cystology, they do autopsies there and surgical tissues are examined such as pap smears and things of that nature. And we make blocks of, when they do biopsies on patients, they may do blocks of tissue so that the pathologist can look at it and see uh, what if it's cancerous and what type of cancer it may be. So we got to remember, okay, that the phlebotomist plays a vital role early in the process of producing reliable, accurate laboratory results and reports, right? It starts at the beginning. If someone in admissions puts the incorrect information in the system about a patient, then right off the bat, we have an issue, okay? And then things can fall apart and become critical later on down the line over this one misstep at the very beginning. And that's the same thing for phlebotomists. If you don't ID your patient correctly, if you don't, um, if you don't draw it correctly, if you don't draw it in the correct tube, if you don't draw it in the correct order, if you don't transport it to the laboratory correctly, then the rest of the phases fall apart from there. So your job is very important and it starts very early. So there's three phases of laboratory testing. There's the pre-analytical phase, the analytical phase and the post-analytical phase. So in the analytical phase, I mean in the pre-analytical phase, that's before testing, okay? Gotta remember this. The pre-analytical phase is every everything that happens before testing of that specimen, okay? That includes the collection, the transportation, and then when you get it down there, the separation and storage of the blood prior to testing, okay? There's lots of things that fall in there. Like I said earlier, how was it transported? Was it, if it was supposed to be on ice, was it? it did you, was, it or, was it drawn in the correct order? Did you ID your patient properly? Did you label your specimens properly? Did you get them to the lab in the amount of time you were supposed to? Were they spun down and separated in the time they were supposed to? And if they weren't able to be tested immediately, were they stored properly, okay? These are critical steps that need to be done accurately to make sure that we're giving out the right lab results because we remember, right, our doctor's making clinical decisions based off these results. Then we have the analytical phase. That's what happens during testing. This includes that proper QC was performed, okay, that we, we used appropriate methods and equipment to run our test, and then we interpreted our uh, results properly. We reported them out properly, right? So we ran our QC on our instrument beforehand, make sure that it's working properly, that we put the correct specimen on the machine, that we used the correct machine and equipment and that it was working properly. And then when those results came off, we interpreted them correctly and, and, and uh, 
and we make sure we interpret the results properly. So post-analytical phase, that's what happens after testing, right? That includes the reporting of the final results, reporting any type of critical or panic values, and then did we store or dispose of the specimens properly? So again, pre-analytical, what happens before testing, analytical phase is what happened during the testing, but that does include QC, and then the post-analytical phase is what happens after testing, and that includes storage and disposal of the specimens properly. So this is a situation I want you to analyze. A new phlebotomist is trying to fill out information, uh, information form for her supervisor. She enlists your help. The form asks, what phase of laboratory testing would your job as a phlebotomist involve? Can you help her answer this question? So pause this video and think about it and see, write it down and see if you come up with the right answer. The pre-analytical phase, right? Because as I said, the phlebotomist job involves all those things that happens before testing, right? So now we're going to move on to the clinical laboratory and specimen collection services. So the federal government regulates all clinical laboratories through different organizations. The Food and Drug Administration, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the department, which is inside the Department of Health and Human Services, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is OSHA, and the Department of Transportation, the DOT. So we know the FDA is Food and Drug Administration. I know all y'all have heard that before. CMS is at Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services and then OSHA is at the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And just remember, their uh, CMS is located inside the Department of Health and Human Services. And these are all organizations you need to be aware of and you need to know who they are, okay? Because they are the ones that regulate clinical laboratories, which is where you'll be working. The CMS regulates clinical laboratories through the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment of 1988 or CLIA 88, okay? Regulations apply to any site that tests human specimens, including physician's office laboratories, which POLS, that's, that's abbreviation for physician office labs, and bedside testing, okay? Any lab that does not meet CLIA requirements will not be allowed to stay open and will be shut down. CLIA 88 is a law. And if you do not abide by all their rules and regulations, they will shut your lab down. So other regulatory agencies other than clinical laboratories are the International Association of Blood Banks, American Society of Clinical Pathologists, the ASCP. And that's, that's the organization that when you sit for your certification exam to become a certified phlebotomist, that's the organization's exam that you will take and you will have that ASCP behind your name. The College of American Pathologists, CAP, they provide accreditation to clinical laboratories that maintain proper quality assurance programs. And then you have Joint Commission and they accredit hospitals themselves, including the lab. So what law regulates labs? Remember, you can pause these and see if you can answer these right. Clear, right? CLIA is a law that regulates labs. Any lab that performs tests on, the, on human blood, right, or human specimens. What does the word regulation mean? A regulation is a rule or a law. CLIA regulates labs or gives the law, labs the rules they might need to follow, okay? So what happens is they set the laws down and they say these are the laws for operating your lab and you have to follow those regulations and laws to make sure that you are following CLIA guidelines so that your lab will not be shut down. Which organization provides accreditation to labs? Remember, now that we got to keep all these straight and these are hard to learn or understand, but make sure you're filling out your review guide and then just start filling them in and start studying them one by one, okay? It's CAP, right? The College of American Pathologists. So CLIA is the, is the organization that regulates labs through laws and 
CAP is the College of American Pathologists, and that's the organization that pro provides accreditation directly to the labs themselves, right? What is accreditation? Okay, you're accredited. What does that mean? Accreditation is just that stamp of approval. Labs that follow the rules get accredited by CAP. CAP puts their CAP on approval, right? That help, that help you, a little learning tool there to help you be able to put these together so when you get this question on a test, you'll know what the answer is. So accreditation is just that stamp of approval. It lets everybody know that someone came in and made sure that that lab was following all the rules and regulations that it needed to follow so that if you're going in there to get your lab results done, you can feel good that this lab you're going to has been accredited, which means they're following the rules. Because again, like we talked about earlier, doctors are making clinical decisions. They're treating people, they're monitoring people, they're diagnosing people based off these lab results. And we wanna make sure that the labs are doing everything the right way, right? So what agency accredited hospitals? Joint Commission, right, JACO? Which organization provides accreditation to clinical laboratories? CAP, remember? So Joint Commission accredits hospitals, CAP accredits labs themselves. But when Joint Commission comes to a hospital, they're gonna go through that lab as well too. They trace the patient from the moment the patient is admitted into the hospital all through to when they've been discharged. They use tracing, okay? And so if that, if that patient has to have lab results done, then JACO is gonna make sure that the labs are doing what they're supposed to do, and then CAP will come in and do the same. So you'll have two accrediting bodies that may be looking at your lab to make sure that you're following the processes and doing it correctly. So which law regulates clinical laboratories? Remember, you can pause this. I'm gonna go through them very fast, but you can pause this at any time. CLIA, right? CLIA is the law. CAP is the accreditation for the lab and JACO is the accreditation for the hospital. So talking about CLIA approved for laboratories, there's three categories laboratory tests are grouped in under to CLIA, okay? You've got wave tests moderately complex and highly complex. So wave tests, these are the ones that's real easy to do. They have the least amount of areas that could provide the least amount of harm to a patient, okay? So examples of that is like when you do a urine dipstick or pregnancy test or glucose screening test, like your little AccuCheck machines or whatever. Those are called wave tests, okay? Then you have moderately complex tests these are easy, but there's a little more risk to hurting the patient if you get it wrong, right? So that's RBCs, WBCs, some chemistry tests like glucose and cholesterols and hemoglobin cinematocrit. Then there's highly complex tests. These are very complex to perform them, and it's at a greater risk to the patient. These are things like bone marrow evaluations, flow cytometry, and electrophoresis. These are very complex tests to perform, so you, have, you need to have a higher degree of education and training to be able to perform these tests, and there's a lot more risk to the patient. So make sure you go through these. Wave, easy, moderately, a little bit harder, but still easy, a little more risk to the patient, and then highly complex. The greater risk to the patient and very complex to perform. So what is the name of the law that regulates clinical laboratories? CLIA, right? And you can pause these. I'm going to go through them fast, but you can pause them since you're watching this. What three levels are lab tests grouped into under CLIA? Remember, we have wave, moderately complex, and highly complex. So you know that CLIA will be coming to the lab where you work soon to inspect it. A phlebotomist you work with, a graduate of another program, tells you she has never even heard of CLIA. She wants you to tell her as much as you can about CLIA. We will pretend, so we can't do it this way in um, a course right here, right? Because you don't, you're not going to be sitting next to your lab partner. So what we can do is pause this uh, slide and then try to explain either to someone in your house or out loud to yourself what CLIA is. So pause this and try to do that quickly. Just try to explain it to yourself or out loud 
And guys, I know this feels kind of silly to be performing. Even in class, students don't usually like it to turn to their lab partner and start talking to them about this. But these are this, this is really how you learn. This is how you hit this stuff home and you learn it. If you truly do what I'm asking you to do, you can be successful and make a really good grade in this class. So what you need to do is go ahead and uh, pause this video and then turn turn to someone in your house and explain it to them or say it out loud, okay? So CLIA is a law that governors all labs that test human specimens. Under CLIA, all labs are inspected. All laboratory tests fall into those three categories, waived, moderately complex, and highly complex. So this is what you would tell somebody if they asked you what CLIA was, right? No one should miss on our first test that CLIA is the law that governors that governs all labs that test human specimens, should they? So what agency accredits hospitals? What organization provides accreditation to clinical laboratories that maintain proper quality assurance programs? What is the name of the law that regu regulates clinical laboratories? Clear, right? And what three levels are lab tests grouped into under CLIA? Your waived, your moderately complex, and highly complex. Okay, make sure you know this. As you know, this is going to be on a test. Okay, so clinical laboratory departments. Clinical laboratories typically have an administrative office and multiple supervisory personnel overseeing specific areas of that lab. So the laboratory manager is a, usually either a pathologist or a medical technologist who oversees the whole lab. So sections of clinical pathology, each with their own supervisor, are you have uh, specimen collection and processing. That's where the phlebotomist works. You usually have a phlebotomy supervisor, okay, that handles that section of the lab, okay. Then you have clinical chemistry. That's tests for chemi uh, chemicals in the liquid part of the blood, such as sugars, fats, proteins, etc. Then you have hematology, where they do the complete blood counts. And usually, and COAG is in that uh, department as well, which talks about your ability to clot. Uh, then you have microbiology and parasitology, where they look for uh, bacteria that grow, uh, bacteria, viruses, parasites, etc. Immunohematology is your blood bank. Immuno, immunology and serology, they test for reactions showing immunity. You have your analysis, which is usually in hematology. And then sometimes you may have a stat lab somewhere like an ICU or in the ER. Clinical laboratory personnel work as a team to provide dependable data to physicians for diagnosing, treating, and monitoring patients. Okay, the pathologist is a doctor with extensive training in pathology and the study of diagnosing of disease through the use of laboratory tests. The technical supervisor is a clinical laboratory science scientists with additional experience and education in this section of the lab, such as hematology, microbiology, or chemistry. So the clinical laboratory scientist or medical technologist, MT, or you also have a medical laboratory scientist, okay? They have a bachelor's degree, which includes one year of study in the CLS program, has a state license and takes a national certification like the ASCP, they perform lab tests, run QC and QA, perform maintenance and troubleshooting for your instruments and machines, participate in continuing education, and teaches pathology residents, MTs, and students, and MLTs, okay? So the medical laboratory technician, MLT, or the clinical laboratory technician, CLT, they have a two-year certificate or associate's degree. They also must have a state license and take a national exam like the ASCP. Now, not all states have a state license. Some states just take your national certification. The fact that you graduated from an accredited university or uh, a community college, and the fact that you have the ASCP behind your name, they don't require a state license. But the state of Louisiana is actually a state that requires a state license, okay, on top of your national certification then they run routine lab tests, prepare specimens and reagents, draw blood, maintain lab equipment, and participate in CEWs. 
The phlebotomist, they must have a high school diploma to enter a training program. So to get into BIPC's phlebotomy program, you have to have at least a high school diploma or a GED, excuse me, and then you enter our program, right? You collect and transport blood, properly ID patients, properly label blood and blood specimens, promote comfort of the patient. You have to do draw time specimen, deliver specimens other than blood, and process specimens and keep accurate records. Can you name six types of laboratory personnel who work in a lab? Okay, you have a pathologist, a phlebotomist, and when you have to list these out on a test, start with yourself, a phlebotomist, you know? That's, a, that's an easy thing to remember. You got medical technologists, medical laboratory technicians, you got the pathologists, laboratory managers, and technical supervisors over laboratory sections like chem chemistry and hematology. Can you put these personnel in order according to a typical laboratory organizational chart from the highest ranking to the lowest? So your laboratory manager, which sometimes can be a pathologist or other times can be a med tech or a clinical laboratory scientist, okay? Then you have your pathologist, then you have technical supervisors that sometimes have some additional education and training as a specialist in hematology or specialist in chemistry. Then you have medical technologists, medical laboratory technicians, and then phlebotomists. So kind of remember the order in which this goes, okay? From the highest at laboratory manager down to the phlebotomist, okay? So talking about competency, certification, and professionalism for phlebotomists. So a high school diploma is required to enter phlebotomy programs. Employers must always require national certification and attending continuing education programs and experience. Okay, so to get into a program, you have to have at least a high school diploma. Okay, and then anybody that's going to hire you like Oshner's or Willis Knighton, Minden Medical, uh, Shumpert are all going to require you to have a national certification such as the ASCP. Then you will have continuing education that you have to do and they want you to have experience. That is why we send you to clinical so you can get that needed experience to help ensure you getting placed in a job. So talking about professional organizations for phlebotomists, okay, one through six down here, we're talking about NPA, uh, ASCLS, AMT, ASCP. This is 99% of our BIPC students take this exam. This is the exam I took for my medical laboratory technologist um, technician uh, certification. Then you have the ASPT and the NHA. Um, contact information for taking the exam through each of these organizations is listed on PowerPoint 12 through 13, okay? So, um, and uh, still on this uh, professional organization for organizations for phlebotomists, okay, an agency that accredits educational programs, but that does not offer certification for examinations and does not perform on-site visit is the National Accrediting Agency for Clinical Laboratory Scientists, NACLS. So NACLS is who accredits educational programs like ours. We are accredited. We are a nationally accredited a uh, phlebotomy program here at BIPC, and we're accredited through NACLS, which is the National Accrediting Agency for Clinical Laboratory Sciences. So what does accreditation mean? Remember, we talked about this earlier. We're going to see if, if, see if it's starting to click with you. Pause it and see if you can answer this. So BIPC phlebotomy program is accredited through an agency that accredits educational programs in phlebotomy. There's only one agency that accredits phlebotomy programs. Can you remember the name of that program? NACLS, right? So what agency accredits labs? CAP, right? What agency accredits hospitals? Do you remember this one? Joint Commission, right? JACO. And what agency certifies phlebotomists? 99% of the phlebotomists that graduate from BIPC. ASCP, right? 
Okay, so moving on. Competencies, certification, and professionalism for phlebotomists. Many organizations have developed competency statements to describe entry-level skills such as those for phlebotomists. Assessing each blood drawing situation and selecting proper equipment. That's something you need to do. You need to be able to look at what you're doing. Are you, uh, do, are you going to able to draw out of the uh, anacuta fossa of the arm, which is the bend in your arm. I'll sometimes say the back of the elbow. Are you going to be able to draw out of there? Are you going to have to draw in the, the uh, back of the hand, right? You need to assess your situation, then select the proper equipment depending on if the patient has good veins, is an older person in their veins role. This is stuff that you need to do and you need to be competent at that. Accurately collecting specimens. Order of draw. Make sure you order it in the proper draw that, that you uh, collect it in the order of draw properly. That you use the correct tube. All these things are important. Use the correct needle. You do it properly. To identify sources of error in specimen collection and transportation, you need to be able to identify any of these places where an error could occur. You have a friend who wants to become a phlebotomist. Can you tell her what it takes to become a phlebotomist legally? That's it, right? Or equivalent. You need to have a high school diploma. Can you tell her what it takes to get a job? Because there's a difference, right? What do you need? These are the things that you can get a, a become a phlebotomist, become a phlebotomist legally. But then what do you need to do to make sure you can get a job? Training in a good program, right? Because we're going to send you, to, we're going to teach you the stuff that we're teaching you right now. We're going to get, we're going to give you hands-on experience in the lab and show you exactly how to do it and the right way to do it. Then we're going to send you out to clinicals where you're going to get hands-on experience in hospital labs, right? Then you sit for your certification exam and then you go to work and get your experience, right? Or you use that training that you got in the hospital as your experience. Can you tell her how to become registered? Take the national certification exam, such as the ASCP, correct? What are some beginning or entry level skills that she will need to have before she will get hired? These are the things that we're going to teach you in Intro to Phlebotomy and Phlebotomy Lab. Selecting the proper phlebotomy equipment to use, doing a good job of collecting a specimen, and being able to identify sources of error in collecting a specimen. So professionalism, talking about professionalism, these are characters and traits, okay? The major points of ethical standards. And please guys, also make sure not only do you watch these PowerPoints and fill out your study guides, but you read chapter one in your phlebotomy handbook, okay? If you do these things, you will be able to make an A in this class. So the three major points of ethical standards is do no harm intentionally, right? We understand that the Hippocratic Oath, uh, do no harm intentionally, we understand that when we draw people's blood, there is a minor amount of pain involved in that, okay? But you're not intentionally trying to harm someone, they're just going to have a small stick and a little bit of pain so that you can get their blood specimens so we can help make them better, right? You're gonna be able to perform according to sound technical abilities and good judgment, respect patients' rights, including the right to confidentiality and privacy and the right to know about treatment and the right to refuse treatment. That's right. Patients have rights. And they have a right that you're not going to you're not going to expose their confidentiality or privacy by talking about their lab works or their situation to anyone other than other coworkers that are you need to talk to them about it. The right to know about their treatment. When you walk in there and I say, hi, I'm Melissa from the lab. I'm going to be here drawing your blood. And if they say to me, well, what are you drawing? They have a right to know what's going on, that you're drawing a CBC. Now, you can tell them that they need to talk to their physician about other stuff because you don't want to talk to them about things that you're really not uh, qualified to speak to them about but they do have the right to know about their treatment. And yes, they can tell you they don't want you to stick them. Now you can try to very politely using your best customer service skills to say, well, Ms. Johnson, I, I know, but you know, your doctor really wants this lab work done so that he can make you better, so that he can figure out what's going on and make you better. If she still refuses to be stuck, 
You're always going to be very polite and you're going to say, okay. And then you're going to go out and let the nurse and the doctor know that the patient refused to, to, be, to have their blood drawn. They can refuse treatment. Okay. The worst thing that can happen to a patient if a specimen is incorrectly labeled or transported is death. Okay. You can kill a patient if you don't properly ID them and you don't properly collect, you don't properly label that um, blood, okay? Ethics is the principles of right and wrong, okay? You need to understand what the definition of ethics is. Confidentiality is patient information whose unauthorized disclosure is prohibited by law in all aspects of healthcare, including medical records, written materials, fax transmissions, and spoken conversation. And we'll talk about this over and over again, but you have to be careful what you say and when you say it. You do not discuss a patient, their lab results, or anything else about that patient if it is not needed to be discussed with the doctor, with the nurse, or with some laboratory personnel. So here's another one of our things. Analyze each situation. Which situation could be a breach of confidentiality? You overhear a doctor telling a nurse that the patient in room 203 has terminal cancer. He wants the nurse to administer pain medication as needed. Okay, so you overhear that conversation. And then you overhear one x-ray tech, his name is John, telling another x-ray tech, Kevin, that he just found out the patient in room 208, Kevin's neighbor, has a sexually transmitted disease. The second one, right? We all know that we may overhear conversations where a doctor is talking to a nurse about one of the patients. And that doctor is always gonna make sure he's in a place where probably the only people that are gonna be able to overhear this is other hospital workers who, who know that that is confidential information. And they are only to discuss it if it needs in situations like that. The doctor needs to tell the nurse this because the nurse needs to know because she's administering medication to this patient and taking care of them, right? That is not a breach of confidentiality. But when people are discussing their neighbors and how they have sexually transmitted diseases and they're telling someone else about it, that is a breach of confidentiality and gets you in a lot of trouble, not the least of it being fired. So healthcare organizations, there's three level of care are primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care. So primary care are given to maintain and monitor normal health. These are minor injuries, colds, well baby checkups, and immunizations. You want to be immunized so that you won't end up getting a disease, right? This is that primary or preventative care that pre it, it's primary when it's just a minor injury or cold, and it's primary preventative care when you want to take your baby to its well baby checkups and get all your baby's immunization so that your baby doesn't end up sick. We're trying to prevent them from getting sick. And making sure you take care of things like minor injuries so they don't lead to major injuries. Okay, so secondary care. That's in care involving a doctor who is an expert on a particular group of diseases or organ systems. Like if you have some type of blood issue and you go to a hematologist or we always take babies to pediatricians or if you're having a baby you go to an obstetrician things like that okay and then there's tertiary care care that is highly specialized and oriented towards unusual and complex diagnosis and therapies like if you need a heart transplant and you're going to a heart transplant physician so you have acute care and that is a stay of less than 30 days in the hospital. And then you have long-term care is a stay more than 30 days in a hospital. So let's analyze this, this situation. Your friend who just had a baby is filling out an insurance form to include her new addition to the family on their insurance. She takes her baby to a pediatrician. The form asks what type of doctor she will primarily use for the care of her baby a primary, secondary, or tertiary care physician. Can you help her answer this question? Secondary, right? Because remember we discussed that if they specialize in something like a pediatrician specializes in babies, then that's secondary care, okay? 
And what type of doctor would she put down if she took the baby just to a general practitioner? That'd be primary care, right? Because a general practitioner is usually someone that can take care of the whole family. They deal with mainly minor stuff. If you need something more than that, then they'll send you to that secondary care, which would be a doctor that specializes in something like babies, okay? So now we're talking about managed care. So we have Medicare, which uh, provides services for the elderly, think care, caring for the elderly, right? Medicaid aid, right? Think giving aid to someone who needs it. They provide services for the poor and those who can't work if you're disabled. And then an HMO provides comprehensive health care by enrolled doctors. Doctors can make limited referrals to specialists and patients pay regular monthly payments. So, what type of managed care provides services for the elderly? Medicare, right? Care, right? Care for the elderly. And then, what type of managed care provides services for the poor and those that can't work? Aid, Medicaid, right? You aid those who can't work. You aid the poor, right? So, accepting assignment is where a doctor agrees with a private insurance company to accept a fixed payment for a given service. The doc must accept what he gets, right? Accept, accept assignment. If Blue Cross and Blue Shield says they only pay $25 for that doctor to do a pregnancy test, and typically the doctor charges $50 for the pregnancy test, if he wants to do Blue Cross and Blue Shield insurance, then he will have to accept what Blue Cross and Blue Shield says they were going to pay and write off the rest of it, right? Captation is a mechanism that pays a set fee to the doctor regardless of the volume of service. The insurance company puts a cap on it, right? They cap how much they're going to pay. And that's kind of what I was talking about early. You know, if, if, if the Blue Cross and Blue Shield says they're putting a cap on how much they're going to pay for, some, for something regardless of the service, you know, then the doctor needs to know that, right? So, what do you call it when a doctor gets a certain payment from an insurance company or Medicare and it doesn't matter whether he does a lot of that procedure or only a few of them? Captation, right? So they put a cap on it, right? And what do you call it when a doctor agrees to take $20 per pregnancy test from the insurance company even though he would like to charge $25? That's accepting assignment, right? What type of managed care provides services for the elderly? What type of managed care provider services the poor? Okay, so moving on to ambulatory settings. So we have ambulatory care settings. No, these are locations where phlebotomists are commonly employed. Hospital-based clinics or emergency centers, group practices, solo where you just have one doctor in there, and then specialty practice, like a cardiology practice. You have rehab centers, blood centers, mobile vans for primary care delivery, mobile mammography units, freestanding surgery centers, health department clinics, and mental health centers. You have school-based clinics, prisons, dialysis clinics, screening centers, home health and hospice, durable medical equipment suppliers, and health maintenance organizations are all places where phlebotomists could, could go to work. So where are some places that you might like to find a job when you finish with this program and get your national certification? So in this chapter, we talked about the definition of phlebotomy and phlebotomist, healthcare organization, hospital departments, the lab, CLIA, three levels of care and managed care, and ambulatory settings and where phlebotomists work. And guys, what you need to do is watch this video. You can pause it, read chapter one in your in your textbook, your phlebotomy handbook, and fill out your review guide for chapter one. And remember, our first lecture test will be on chapters one, six, and seven, but you will also have that lecture quiz on profiles and panels. 
So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you have multiple ways you can reach out to me. But if you will do, if you will study that um, Profiles and Panels quiz and get ready for that, if you will uh, listen to these PowerPoints and fill out your review guides and read chapter one in your phlebotic handbook this week, you are on the right track, okay? Because that will help you because next week we move on to chapter six, then we move on to chapter seven, and your first test in lecture, your first test in lecture will be on those three chapters. Your first quiz in lecture will be on the profiles and panels. Okay, you guys have a great day.